Antipathogens and immune boosters are two sides of the same coin. You need them both. Immune boosters stimulate your immune system to more aggressively attack pathogenic invaders. Antipathogens free up immune function by directly destroying pathogens in your body that would otherwise occupy the attention of your immune system. In fact, many immune boosters also have antipathogenic properties, and all antipathogens can boost your immune system even if just by subtraction. That is, simply by destroying invaders, antipathogens free up your immune system from having to do the job. Your immune system now has more available resources to do other things, such as tracking down newly formed mutated rogue cells. And the more your immune system can focus on rogue cells, the less likely any of them can become full-blown cancer. So, what is an antipathogen? Simply, it's something that destroys bacteria, viruses, yeast infections, and fungi. Any pathogenic invader, actually. Antibiotics and antivirals are one-dimensional man-made antipathogens. Garlic and olive leaf extract, on the other hand, are just two examples of multi-dimensional natural antipathogens. To be sure, pharmaceutical antipathogens have saved countless lives over the years and rank as one of the great medical discoveries of the last century. But we are now confronting one of their great deficiencies, their one-dimensional purity that has allowed bacteria and viruses to mutate around them. And that's why none of the old antibiotic standards work anymore. Natural antipathogens, on the other hand, are not pure. They are not patentable, and they certainly are not one-dimensional. Each one, in fact, contains numbers of antipathogenic biochemical compounds. And it is this multidimensionality that turns out to be their greatest strength. They are simply too complex for bacteria and viruses to mutate around. Unlike pharmaceuticals, garlic, Olive leaf and oil of oregano are still effective even given thousands of years for those pathogens to find a way to defeat them. How can that be? And the answer is that while drugs, as we have discussed, are one-dimensional in their mode of attack, which allows microbes an easy path to evolve around, natural antipathogens often contain several active biochemicals, often a dozen or more. To be sure, not all of them are necessarily active when tested in isolation but many of the so-called inactive components potentiate the active ones and offer therapeutic combinations beyond counting, even within a single plant. This presents a complexity that makes it virtually impossible for microbes to work around. Take garlic as an example. Researchers now know that the allicin in garlic is rapidly oxidized, breaking down into more than 100 biologically active sulfur-containing compounds. While allicin still serves as a marker of garlic's potency, s cysteine and other sulfur compounds formed from allicin are now recognized as the most therapeutically active ingredients. So, how many possible pathogenic defense combinations can you get from garlic's 100 biologically active compounds? A whole bunch. Thousands and thousands and thousands. Look at it this way. With just three active biochemicals, let's call them A, B, and C, you have seven possible combinations each one presenting a different roadblock to pathogens. With four active biochemicals, the number essentially doubles to 15, and with five biochemicals, it doubles again to 31. Keep doubling it 95 more times to account for garlic's 100 biologically active compounds, and the number of possible combinations is beyond counting. And that's why garlic is still effective even after millennia of human use. And now, when you put together a natural antipathogenic formula where each ingredient consists of multiple biochemicals, all attacking the invading pathogens in their own way, the number of defense combinations in such a formula is simply beyond imagining. It's both deadly to pathogens and simply unassailable in terms of their mutating around it. So, with that understanding in our back pocket, let's take a look at a prototypical all-natural antipathogenic formula. And let's start with garlic which is not only kind to the beneficial bacteria in your intestinal tract, but one of the best infection fighters available for both bacterial and viral infections. Garlic also possesses some immune-boosting properties, such as the ability to stimulate the activity of macrophages to engulf foreign organisms, such as viruses, bacteria, and yeast. Furthermore, garlic increases the activity of the helper T cells. Garlic may be particularly effective in treating upper respiratory viral infections due to its immune-enhancing properties and its ability to clear mucus from the lungs. It also is effective against Streptococcus and Staphylococcus bacteria and even Bacillus anthracis, which produces the poison anthrax. According to the Cochrane database, a study found that out of 146 test subjects, 
those taking a garlic supplement for 12 weeks reported 111 days of illness as a result of getting the common cold virus versus 356 for the placebo group, a 300% difference. As for onions, everything that's been said about garlic goes for onions too. Onions and garlic share many similar antipathogenic sulfur-bearing compounds. Olive trees aren't just good for olive oil. Olive leaf extract has a long history of use against microorganisms. Studies of olive leaf extracts containing olirupin, calcium alenolate, and or hydroxytyrosol found it effective in eliminating a very broad range of organisms, including bacteria, viruses, parasites, yeast, mold, and fungi. In addition, olive leaf has demonstrated antiviral activity against both HIV infection and replication, primarily by blocking the entry of the virus into host cells in the body's immune system. Habanero and horseradish are stimulants that quicken and excite the body. They energize it, stimulating its defenses against invading viruses and help to carry blood to all parts of the body. They are diaphoretics and thus help raise the temperature of the body, which increases the activity of the body's immune system. They are both often used in herbal formulas to complement and potentiate the activity of other ingredients. In fact, studies have shown they can even potentiate the activity of pharmaceutical antibiotics, which effectively validates their use in herbal formulas for the same purpose. But make no mistake, in addition to potentiating the other antipathogenic ingredients in this formula, both habanero and horseradish have powerful antipathogenic properties in their own right. Horseradish in particular contains volatile oils that have shown antibiotic properties which may account for its effectiveness in treating throat and upper respiratory tract infections as well as urinary tract infections. And yet another study found the volatile oils were effective against pathogens such as H. influenzae, M. catarallis, E. coli, P. aeruginosa, Missa MRSA, and S. pyrogenes. Meanwhile, capsicum has demonstrated antibacterial activity against microbes such as Streptococcus mutans, not to mention inhibitory activity against both yeast and candida infections. Like colloidal silver, liquid ionic zinc is both antibacterial and antiviral, but without the potential skin discoloration issues associated with silver. The mineral zinc is found in all body fluids, including the moisture in the eyes, lungs, nose, urine, and saliva. Proper zinc levels offer defense against the entrance of pathogens. In the 1800s, surgeons used zinc as an antiseptic antibiotic after surgery, and they noted its amazing healing properties. Because zinc moves through all the fluids in the body, it creates a defense against infection-causing bacteria and viruses trying to enter the body and stops bacterial and viral replication. In addition, as noted by the CDC, a study in Bangladesh showed that zinc supplementation significantly reduces the duration and severity of diarrhea in children suffering from cholera, recovering in as few as two or three days. Oil of wild mountain oregano is antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, and antiparasitic. The key component appears to be an isomeric phenol known as carvacrol, which has proven effective against at least 11 multi-resistant pathogenic bacteria. In dilutions as low as 1 to 50,000, oil of oregano can destroy a wide range of pathogens including Candida albicans, Aspergillus mold, Staphylococcus, Campylobacteria, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Salmonella, MRSA, E. coli, and Giardia, not to mention Legionnaire's disease. It has also been proven effective against norovirus, Hepatitis A, and the acyclovir-resistant herpes simplex virus. Another phenol constituent of oregano, thymol, helps boost the immune system. In fact, the combination of thymol and carvacrol has been shown to inactivate herpes simplex by some 90% in as little as one hour. According to the University of Maryland Medical Center, the active ingredients in ginger are the volatile oils and pungent phenol compounds such as gingerols and shogaols. Although ginger is commonly thought of as an anti-inflammatory, it is also a strong antipathogen, especially against the multi-drug resistant bacteria. In addition, studies have shown that it has strong dose-dependent virucidal activity against a number of viruses, probably as a result of interfering with the viral envelope. Other pathogens that it's been proven effective against include S. mutans, Candida albicans, and E. phycalis. Apple cider vinegar is anathema to all kinds of germs that attack the throat. In effect, it acts like a sponge and draws out throat germs and toxins from the surrounding tissue. Also, because of its acetic acid content, it stimulates a condition called acetolysis, in which toxic wastes that are harmful to the body are broken down and rendered harmless. Now, 
that covers some of the key ingredients you'll find in an effective antipathogenic formula. Before we wrap things up, there are two items we need to discuss. Cytokine storms and what's known as the incubation phase. Having a strong immune system is a good thing, but in some situations it can work against you unless you also are using an antipathogenic formula. In a cytokine storm, certain viruses cause your immune system to go nuts, whipping itself into a frenzy in response to the invading virus. A biochemical cascade of immune cells and immune system biochemicals such as interferon, interleukin, and monokines, collectively known as cytokines, literally pours into the lungs. The subsequent damage to the lung tissue caused by these cells and biochemicals leads to a condition called acute respiratory distress syndrome that literally chews up your lung tissue, which causes fluids to pour into your lungs, ultimately causing you to suffocate as a result of your own disease-fighting chemistry. Understand, most common flus and colds do not produce cytokine storms. Most flus kill people who have weak immune systems by eventually opening the door for pneumonia which is what actually kills them. But swine flu, avian flu, and most notably the great flu pandemic of 1918 are different animals. They don't kill through pneumonia. They don't cause internal bleeding. They kill you by unleashing a cytokine storm, which means that it is your own immune system that kills you. Does that mean you should weaken your immune system to protect against the flu? Of course not. However, it does mean that you want natural antipathogens on hand in your medicine cabinet to use the first sign of a cold or flu. It will protect you against the standard flu, and if you perchance catch a rogue strain of avian or swine flu, the antipathogens will kill enough of the virus to take your viral load down to the point that it will not unleash a cytokine storm. You get the best of all possible worlds. And now let's talk about the incubation phase. The incubation phase of an infection is the period of time between exposure to a pathogenic organism and when the classic full-blown symptoms and signs of the disease first become apparent. For the flu, this period can run from one to three days. For the common cold, two to five days. Everyone knows the symptoms for a full-blown cold or flu, but when it comes to the incubation phase, we tend to rationalize symptoms as, I'm really tired, I need to catch some extra sleep. I shouldn't have eaten that extra ice cream. I, I can feel it in my throat. My allergies are kicking in. My nose is starting to plug up. I think I strained myself cleaning the house today. My body aches. The kids drove me crazy. I have a dull headache. But it's important not to ignore these early symptoms. Stopping the flu, for example, in the incubation phase is much, much easier than getting rid of it once established. If you hit it hard during incubation, you can almost always stop it from taking hold. If you allow it to incubate and fully manifest, it will take you several days to beat it back. And yes, you can significantly cut the time of your sickness with antipathogens, but you will still be sick for several days. Definitely, it's better to shut it down during incubation. And what's the worst that can happen if you read it wrong and you're not actually infected? Well, you end up having some garlic and olive leaf extract a couple of times because the kids really did drive you crazy. Is that too high a price to pay for almost never getting sick? So, where does that leave us? Antipathogens both kill and inhibit viruses and bacteria. If used during the incubation phase, they have the potential to totally eliminate most invading microbes before you ever get sick. If used after the pathogen takes hold, the antipathogenic formula will inhibit and kill enough of the invaders to allow your immune system to do its job more easily. In other words, an antipathogenic formula can both shorten duration of your illness and lessen its intensity. One thing to keep in mind is that you probably want to keep a supply of natural antipathogens in your medicine cabinet. Looking to buy after the fact is a bit like closing the barn doors after the llamas have left. First, you won't have anything on hand to use during the incubation phase and stop your illness before it ever starts. And second, if you need the formula during a viral pandemic, you might find the shelves bare by the time you get there. And it's not like your stock of antipathogenic formula will go to waste, as you'll be using it regularly to prevent and shorten the duration of everyday colds and flus. You're always going to need an antipathogenic formula to defend you. That's a simple fact of life.